Professor Benjamin Hopkins, what is the East India Company? The British East India Company was a uh, semi-commercial company founded in the year 1600 by a royal charter by Queen Elizabeth, which gave it the exclusive right to trade with the Indies of the English merchants. Over time, it transformed into a kind of parastatal juggernaut and behemoth that is extremely complex and difficult to understand. But the key thing about the East India Company was that after the mid-18th century, the East India Company came to rule over much of the South Asian subcontinent, which included most of modern-day Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. Uh, the East India Company was rolled up in 1858 following the Great Mutiny of 1857 and 1858, and control of the South Asian subcontinent passed directly to the British Crown. How did it get its charter? Its charter was um, granted to a group of merchants who had petitioned the uh, Elizabethan court uh, for the exclusive right to trade. And it was actually uh, one of a number of European trading companies, uh, including the Hudson's Bay Company that was also chartered by the English Crown. But its main competitors were uh, the French East India Company, which comes in the late 17th century, and more powerfully and importantly, the Dutch East India Company, or the VOC, which um, largely followed the same course of conquest and rule, but over the Indonesian archipelago. Now, when you say it ruled, what was its geographical area that it ruled, and how did it rule? That's a very complex question, because the East India Company, being a kind of parastatal organization, didn't exercise the same kind of rights and privileges that we think of as a state. What do I mean by that? Well, for instance, over the areas of South Asia which it ruled, it didn't rule exactly as a sovereign. It controlled that area both as a vassal of the Mughal emperor, who had rights to collect taxes, but also as a subject of the British crown. And so the East India Company had this kind of dual nature, where it recognized both the sovereignty of the British crown and also the suzerainty of the Mughal emperor. And so it actually uh, was charged with ruling over great swaths of South Asia uh, in the name of both these monarchs at the same time. Now, uh, its area of remit, where it had formal control, actually rather than kind of, as it were, uh, coloring all the map red, was spotches of concentration. So for instance, Calcutta, where its main trading port was, uh, there was a strong established presence. But when you got into the Mosifal, or the countryside, um, up until the 20th century, uh, there were a number of Indian peasants that had never seen a Gora or a white man. And so its control over the countryside was spotchy at best, which in part explains its downfall with the mutiny in 1857. Now, in your book, The Making of Modern Afghanistan, what's its role in Afghanistan? What was its role? The East India Company uh, had a number of different strategic uh, interests in the area beyond the Indus, which would in the Indus River, which would include much of modern day Pakistan and what we think of as modern day Afghanistan. Uh, the East India Company's main concern was that of security not of external security so much, um, as there is a large swath of historical literature which talks about the so-called great game in Afghanistan, which is this issue of Anglo-Russian rivalry uh, between competing and expanding British Empire in South Asia and a Russian Empire in Central Asia. Yet rather than being concerned about an external enemy, the Russians necessarily, at the early part of the 19th century, the East India Company was much more concerned with its own internal security. And what it sought to do was stabilize its rule within South Asia uh, by stabilizing its frontier. And so the East India Company initially gets drawn into Afghanistan as a matter of fact in order to stabilize its own rule in South Asia. When did the Great Game begin? The Great Game if one subscribes to it, uh, really begins, uh, there's some literature that says it begins in the early uh, 18th, 19th century, excuse me, 
Um, other literature really sees the heyday in the late 19th century, once the Russians have established their own rule over the Central Asian uh, Emirates in the 1860s and once they build the Central Asian Railroad in the 1870s and 1880s. But it's important to note that even the most hawkish British strategic thinker, um, when writing about the impending Russian threat to British India marching through Afghanistan, virtually all of them acknowledged that this was a far away, if not impossible thing that would happen. And the main concern was not actually, you know, hordes of Russian Cossacks, as it were, invading British India, as it was the rumor of a Russian army on the doorstep of British India, which would spread around the bazaar and destabilize the security of the British Indian state internally. So, Professor Hopkins, is the East India Company responsible for British involvement in Afghanistan, or how did that work? Yeah, um, well, it was really driven by personalities in large part. There are a number of players that in the 1830s, um, as the East India Company is recovering from a part of a global depression and reassessing its role in South Asia, uh, some of the upper echelons of the company start to look for new opportunities. And one of the new opportunities they see is to drive British trade into Central Asia and into Afghanistan. And so it's kind of a story of, of the flag following trade in which uh, free traders um, are looking for opportunities to expand a British footprint and British influence in the area by driving British goods into the area. And so that's how uh, the East India Company's involvement starts in Afghanistan. They see this as a potential area of commercial development. But as I said, uh, free trade at this point in time is also a political and not simply an economic ideology. So the flag follows trade in terms of once British goods are in the market and the bazaars and circulating, there is a feeling that the British flag or the flag of the East India Company needs to be there to both protect it and influence that. And over time that snowballs and increasingly draws uh, the East India Company into an increasing uh, penetration and involvement with Afghanistan. But the other part that I think is very important and that um, my own book touches upon is the East Indian Company's role in South Asia itself because the story I've just told you about trade, about Russian influence is one that's often told. What's less often told is how the East India Company sees participation in Afghanistan as a way of undercutting local rivals within South Asia. For example, in the Punjab, which is where modern day Pakistan and India split, there was an extraordinarily strong indigenous kingdom, uh, the Sikh kingdom, under the leadership of Ranjit Singh. And he was the main competitor to the East India Company in the 1820s and 1830s. He had a European trained army, officered by ex-Napoleonic officers, many of whom had connections with officers in the Tsarist army because once Napoleon's forces break apart, many of these officers go as global mercenaries. So they get hired by indigenous kingdoms in the Punjab or by the Tsar's armies in Russia. And the East India Company was fearful of Ranjit Singh's power. After all, he had a standing professional European trained army of over 80,000 troops directly abutting the East India Company's territories. So in part, their interest in Afghanistan was driven by a strategy to encircle Ranjit Singh and cut him off by making, yes, a buffer state between an expanding Russian empire and English empire, but also an encircling state, which would cut off the potential for Ranjit Singh to flex his muscle. So, Professor Hopkins, how much responsibility does the British involvement that you're discussing have in making what is today Afghanistan? It would be correct to say Afghanistan is a colonial creation. One of my colleagues has referred to it as a fiscal colony of British India. Um, I think it's important to note that simply saying it's a colonial creation 
doesn't mean it's in some way not real. After all, the United States of America was a colonial creation. We were 13 colonies that broke away from the British crown in the 18th century. So to say it's a colonial creation,